Hello, I'm Joan Nassauer speaking to you from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I wish that I could be there with you in Suzhou, a city that I've been lucky to enjoy a number of times in the past. Uh, nonetheless, I'm so happy to be able to address you, the members of the ILIA. One of the things that gives me particular pleasure about speaking to you is knowing that some of your leading members, people who've accomplished wonderful work in landscape architecture in China, were once my students. And uh, one of the greatest pleasures of being a professor is seeing the amazing work that people who were once your students accomplish in the world. I hope that the talk that I'll start in just a minute helps you in your work think about how you can accomplish even more, not only to achieve good landscape design, but also to fundamentally improve the environmental function that is left behind in the wake of the landscape design projects you do. The message that I'll deliver is to suggest that that really is the most important thing that we do as landscape designers. Now I'll switch to the slides. I'm Joan Nassauer from the University of Michigan. And you see my contact information there on this slide, and you'll see it again on the end slide. Today I'm going to be describing how landscape appearance affects environmental health. To affect environmental health, landscape appearance has to be changed by ecological design that is based on science and that invites civic engagement. For example, in the slides at the top, you see a gardener in Australia, a walker who's about to go fishing in England, people taking care of a vacant property in Flint, Michigan. You see in the fourth photo, people who care deeply about the loss of trees in their Berlin neighborhood, and they're showing it by the signs on their building. And you see urban gardeners on the right in Tampa, Florida. All of these people are affecting landscape appearance in a way that affects environmental health. And affecting landscape appearance requires their civic engagement. The message of the, of the talk, and that I'll repeat again at the end, is that the way that people and institutions show the intention to care for the landscape, show it in a way that's visible, that people can see, like the image on the bottom of the screen. The way that people and institutions show the intention to care for the landscape by design and management affects the quality and sustainability of environmental functions that we all count on. A way that we can change the relationship between landscape appearance and environmental health is by understanding the cultural sustainability cycle. This is something that I've written about in the two papers that I've cited at the bottom of this screen. The way the landscape looks affects human actions to construct and maintain landscape patterns that affect environmental processes. Our own cultural values and norms, that is the way we think other people expect things to be, lead us to <clears throat> behaviors and actions that change landscape pattern and appearance. And then we, the way we perceive those landscape patterns and appearance either 
are consistent with our cultural values and norms or not consistent with those cultural values and norms. If they're not consistent, we change landscape pattern. Those changes don't necessarily relate to environmental health. They aren't necessarily motivated by improving ecosystem services. What the cultural sustainability cycle suggests is how ecological design can bring motivations to improve environmental health and ecosystem services into the appearance of landscapes so that our perceptions of landscapes and our desires to change the landscape to conform with cultural norms are consistent with improving environmental health. And this principle of using our actions to conform with cultural norms to improve environmental health can be used for both urban and rural landscapes. Without an ecological design motive for design and planning decisions, landscapes that fill cultural norms and support market values can and often do undermine ecological health and fail to provide ecological systems. This is true all over the world. We think in our development decisions, in our agricultural decisions, that we're improving uh, livelihoods, that we're improving economic systems, that we're improving market values, even that we're improving the aesthetic experiences of for people. But if we aren't also thinking about how we improve ecological health at the same time, we can, in the upper left image, be increasing sprawl and reducing water quality. We can, in the upper right image, be profoundly affecting water quality and quantity, enhancing drought conditions and sprawl. In the lower left, we can, in what may appear to be an idyllic pastoral living environment, actually be undermining water quality and reducing biodiversity and increasing the carbon load on the environment by living in places that are very far from each other and that require lots of vehicle miles. And in rural Iowa, on the lower right, a landscape that is among the productive soil in the world is also a landscape that is among the most limited in biodiversity and the most damaging to water quality. All of these are examples of so-called improvements that we've made by design and planning and management that have high ecological costs. However, without displaying human intentions for care, natural ecosystems that provide all of these ecosystem services can look messy or illegible, and especially in an urban context. And so, in all of these United States examples, native wetlands, native prairies, wooded stream corridors and native woodlands have become smaller and smaller and smaller as a proportion of the human dominated landscape. That is the utility and even the beauty of these native ecosystems which produce high ecological functions has not been apparent to people as we occupy the landscape. On our urban planet, we need to ask as designers, how can design contribute to providing ecosystem services? That is clean air, clean water, productive soil, biodiversity benefits that were provided by native ecosystems in the past. In the upper right, we see an example, a map of the entire Mississippi River watershed, the largest river watershed in the United States, that delivers through the combination of urban land uses in red, but the vast agricultural land uses in green, the combination of, the, of how those landscapes are designed creates an enormous dead zone, a hypoxic zone at the mouth of the Mississippi River watershed. And this is perhaps only the most 
obvious annual signal that the way we are designing and using these landscapes has high ecological costs. From global scales to the finest scales of human effects like this tiny garden in the lower right, an ecological design approach is essential to providing sustained ecosystem services. Over time, my research in urban and rural settings has led me to conclude that for extensive, sustained ecological benefits, design and management should plan to mark the land, to mark the land with clearly visible traces of rooted human intention, human intention to care for a place, and I have called these cues to care. Cues to care, these clear visible marks, are visible landscape characteristics that reflect local norms and values for orderliness, cleanliness, and control. Cues to care convey engaged human presence or ownership, and when they convey this presence or ownership, this sends the message that a place that has cues to care is a civil or neighborly place, the impression we get in this Melbourne, Australia landscape in the upper left. Also, they convey that these are safe places, an idea that we, that's conveyed by this new neighborhood in a legacy city in the United States in Cleveland. They also convey that whether it's real estate that we're looking at selling or agricultural produce, cues to care convey the idea of marketability or productivity. Produce from a garden that looks like this one in the upper right in Tampa, Florida, is much more appealing to us than produce that comes from a garden that looks messy or ill cared for. Similarly, real estate that looks orderly, like we see in the two other images in this slide, commands a higher market value because of the cues to care than if it did not look well cared for. And I've written about these ideas since the mid-90s, and you see two key references there at the bottom of this slide. Some of the landscape characteristics that I've learned through my research are widely understood across many cultures as cues to care are what looks neat or orderly. That means no litter, things are put away where they belong, and there are no, there are no plants that look like weeds or uneven surfaces. The structures are in good repair. They're, they are well painted and unbroken. There is mown turf in at least some of the most publicly visible areas of the landscape. Some of the trees may be trimmed and hedges may be trimmed. Plants are in straight rows or <clears throat> at least in clearly ordered rows. There are visible crisp edges of different patch types. Fences or walls might be employed, especially where they mark boundaries and a powerful cue that seems to trans, uh, to go across many cultures is colorful flowers that are, their vivid colors are highly visible. In some cultures, painted tree trunks or painted stones are another cue. Also in some cultures, cues that show human st structures to accommodate wildlife homes, bird boxes, or lawn ornaments, structures that are placed in the landscape to be decorative, can convey cues to care. <clears throat> and finally, one cue to care is a simple sign that educates people that the occupants of the place are taking care of it and the ecosystem functions that are there. I have identified and tested in many design research projects. I show them uh, with sites uh, that have been designed that exemplify this idea. For example, having crisp edges, clear edges in the design, 
and plants in rows, like you see in this example in Wellington, New Zealand, and the example below it in Duisburg, Germany. Having boundaries that are clearly marked by fences or walls, like you see in this example in a residential landscape in the United States, as well as this park, Millennium Park in Chicago. Using selective mowing, selective turf, not all turf, and well-kept structures, like you see in these examples in Shanghai and in Cross Creek Ranch. Colorful flowers, like you see in this early rainwater garden design by my lab, as well as in this classic work of the Biltmore Estate by Frederick Law Olmsted. Canopy trees, where the understory is either mown or very low, are a cue to care that also has been connected to deep bioevolutionary responses to the landscape. And finally, literal signs and ornaments. The bird feeder that we see here in Switzerland, the residential graffiti protesting the loss of trees in Berlin, and this small sign from Detroit, Michigan, all help people understand the human intention to care for a place. In my studies, there is strong agreement across many sites that what looks messy or lacks neatness is unattractive, seems unsafe, and is less marketable. In Detroit, below may be the most stunning example in my own work of an opportunity to change that place by introducing cues to care. Cues to care are inherently a social gesture. It is about showing the presence of people. And for this reason, cues to care build and elicit civic engagement. That is, people paying attention to their neighbors' values and concerns and working to make their place, their community, a desirable place to live. Sometimes that means working together, like these people in Flint, Michigan, and in southern Germany at the bottom of the slide. Sometimes it means working on your own property, like the gardener in the upper left. Sometimes it means working to improve neighborhoods for others, like in the upper right, and sometimes it simply means using public investment to create places that look well cared for and suggest a valued civic realm, like in the Luxembourg Gardens of Paris that you see in the middle top. When landscape pattern functions first as a cultural sign of local community values, then the pattern also can embody other environmental functions that provide ecosystem services. In this study by me, Jafang Wong, and Eric Dayrell, we demonstrated that in a, in a web survey that people who might like a landscape like the one you see below that was very conventional and covered with turf also would like a landscape like this that had much less turf, much more habitat, would have produced much cleaner water and air. They would like a landscape like this as long as their neighbors all did something similar. We learned that there is a strong relationship between care and neighborliness. We were able to measure that what your neighbor's yards look like strongly influences what you prefer for your own private property. If on the left you were shown that all of your neighbor's yards look conventional, that is what you preferred with a high mean value of almost six. If in the middle you were shown that all of your neighbor's yards looked 
different and introduced in ecological innovations like this native cover that we see in the middle, that is what you preferred for your own yard with the mean value of higher than six. And if what you see is a mix of things that might include mature trees like we see on the right, along with conventional yards or innovative yards, you would tend to prefer either an innovative yard or a conventional yard, our web survey suggested. The message from that study was that we can employ the values, norms, and appearance of care at this scale, especially at a neighborhood scale working at the scale of neighborhoods, not just individual properties. And that will be sustained to foster the health in regional and watershed scale systems. We need the neighborhood to work to make the watershed and the continent and even the planet work to have healthy ecosystems. In one example here in the United States and Minnesota, a project that my design lab did in the mid-90s, we worked at the scale of an individual neighborhood to show how this much larger metropolitan watershed could change. We developed what at that time was a new concept, the rainwater garden concept, to replace conventional drainage in the neighborhood that you see at the upper left with rainwater gardens on sandy soils. This is a concept that since has become widespread. And this reduced peak stormwater flows and clean stormwater going to surface waters nearby. The key was to make it work at the scale of the neighborhood, to make it something that everyone in the neighborhood found to be attractive and what they wanted in their own yard. It included an uh, using large, larger gardens that demonstrated what people could do in their own yards. We then were able to employ cues to care in a, in a shopping center that was demolished, you see it in the upper right, to make a wetland park. And by using cues to care in the design of the wetland park that you see at the middle of the screen in this same metropolitan watershed in Minnesota, we were able to create a system that was repeated in other places in the watershed. It used selective mowing of south-facing lawns that were adjacent to multifamily hot shopping and the new residential district. It used native plants that were very flowery and planted in crisp, bold patterns, and it provided large scenic vistas from the trail system. It was important that we worked with people in the neighborhood to help them understand why a shopping center was being demolished and what this new park would be like. So we worked with people children in the local schools to educate them to understand what the purpose, what the environmental purposes of this new park would be, and they explained the park's functions to their families. By working with these school children, we were exchanging our ecological knowledge and local not with their local knowledge in a way that helped to sustain the park. These children, all their families had just come to the United States from Cambodia, and so they helped their families understand something that was new to all of them. The park design used cues to care throughout. So you see selective mowing on the right. You see a well-kept structure around a boardwalk in the middle, but on the left, you see a wetland that might look messy and unkept if it weren't shown immediately adjacent to these well cared for structures. Over time, this park has become a favorite place of people in the neighborhood. And in fact, the market values around the park have risen so much that some of the park intended parkland has been taken for market value housing 
because the park itself is seen as a beautiful place. These same principles of cues to care have held in many studies we and others have done and in particular they've been useful in our empirical study and design guidelines for brownfields contaminated lands in Chicago and in our studies of how rural and metropolitan highway corridors should be managed. Thinking about the highway project we learned that highway corridors do not need to be mown in order to look attractive to people in urban centers and that the plant mix for these corridors does not need to be an even non-native plant mix. On the other hand, we learned as we had in our other studies that a weedy uneven appearance will always be seen as highly unattractive. So what is attractive? A mix of native flowery plants mown in a picturesque curve was one of the thing we, things we tested and this was well liked by drivers on the highway but an alternative that was less expensive a simple straight mow strip showing the cues to care mixed with a flowery even planting of native plants was the most valued of the choices and also among the least expensive to maintain. Thinking about brownfields in Chicago, we asked what is the relationship between clean and orderly? What is the relationship between habitat and the toxicity of some abandoned industries. How should we design for humans and wildlife when we are not certain about remaining contaminants, remaining toxic substances? What we learned is that what looks messy might actually be ecologically sound. At the top we see a pristine oak savanna. However, what looks orderly may be an ecological mess of inadequately remediated contaminants. Here you see an icon of American design in Seattle, Gas Works Park, but in the paper that you see on the screen, Meltem Erdem and I examined its history of being remediated for contamination as new contaminants are found on the site. Design and planning can aim to be precautionary, to make what looks orderly actually be orderly in the ecological health it delivers. Brownfield sites can look like and function as habitat, but they still may convey contaminants through the food chain. These eggs of uh, wetland birds are not likely to hatch to become healthy wildlife because of contaminants in this system left behind by the steel industry. A more precautionary approach would limit wildlife habitat and wildlife contact even where the landscape looks like habitat. What looks natural is not always desirable. On brownfield sites, Neater may be better for ecological health. When contaminants might move through water, soil, or air, use even more cues to care to separate the contaminants from people and wildlife. Using only some cues to care in the slide on the left, if there are contaminants remaining, the native flowery plants and wetland habitat might actually move those contaminants into the food chain. On the right, a landscape that mows more completely and that reduces habitat along the edge of the stormwater retention area actually may be more healthy where contaminants remain. I hope these examples have shown that landscape appearance, the landscape appearance we create by our ecological design affects environmental health and that environmental health affects human well-being. 
ecological design when it's based on sound science and a knowledge of environmental functions can promote civic engagement and environmental health at the same time. The message I hope to leave with you for your own work is that the way that people and institutions mark the landscape by design and management shows the intention to take care of a place and this affects both the quality and sustainability of landscape environmental functions from the very finest scales to the broadest scales of continents and global environmental health. In the beginning of this lecture I asked you to think about the environment and the quality of the environment as really the most important thing we accomplish as landscape designers. Clean air, clean water, productive soil, healthy places for people to be. But in the lecture I've given you, I focused on the way the landscape looks and the way that we show in our designs how the landscape is well cared for. What I hope these two things, the way the landscape looks and the quality of the environment say to you when you put them both together is that they need each other. The way your work shows that the landscape is well cared for and makes it possible to maintain so that it stays looking well cared for is the basis for allowing environmental functions that keep us all healthy to be continued. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to address you, the landscape designers who are affecting landscapes all over China. <laughs>